Good morning, Ridge Point Church. We're really glad you're here as we wrap up a series we called Influences. We've invited some people who've been influential in my life to come and speak, and, and every week it's been so good. And this week I'm really humbled by this, this opportunity to have Mr. Bob Carver with us this morning. Uh, I've said some, some great things about each of the speakers, and, and he's kind of embarrassed. I mentioned some stuff on Facebook, and he said, don't say anything nice about me this morning, but i got to share this story. Because when I first started uh, at Clearwater Christian College, I was a relatively new believer. I didn't know a lot of people at the college. In fact, the only person I really knew was, was my eventual wife. And I was transferring in, and, and I got noticed that a guy by the name of Dr. Oliver was going to be my academic advisor. And they actually shared office space at that point. And so I went to the office, knocked on the door, hoping to find Dr. Oliver, who I grew to love as well later on. Uh, but Mr. Carver answered the door, and I said, are, are you Dr. Oliver? And he said, I'm not, but come on in. And and he started to kind of ask me questions about my life, and he prayed for me. And he didn't have to do this, but he spent over an hour that morning with me. And we had a lot of other stuff, busy stuff that he could have been doing. He spent that time, and throughout the course of the next couple of years, he poured so much into us and to the students that were there. Uh, became such a great influence in my life. And I know he just kind of set that bar really high. His amazing wife is with him as well. I believe they're about to celebrate, is it 50 years? In, in just a short order. So we're excited to have them with us this morning. If you would help me welcome Mr. Carver. Well, I, I just want to tell you what a joy it is for me to be here today. Uh, I don't know whether there's anybody in this service who was in the last service, but I'm just sort of repeating myself that this this is a an incredible honor for me to be here. Uh, I, I remember with uh, great fondness those days when JJ was a student, and also when Tim T I double M was a student too. Some of you, any of you in here remember Tim? Tim Collins. I love Tim. Although I haven't been able to see Tim in uh, quite a long time, uh, JJ's brought me up to date on some of the things that relate to him. Uh, just before we start this morning, I have to share with you a, a kind of a funny story. Um, JJ said that uh, my wife and I are soon in. in June, we're going to celebrate our 50th wedding anniversary, and uh, we just took a trip, kind of a pre-50th anniversary trip, up to the Smokies, uh, uh, went through Georgia and saw some plantations and estates and all that, and I, my wife loves those things and the flowers, and I thought it was a great time of year to travel with the flowers. I love waterfalls and hiking and stuff like that, and we were up in the Smokies, we were staying in Townsend to the north uh, west of the park and uh, we drove Cades Cove anybody who's been up there have driven that and when you when you get to a certain point on Cades Cove you can park and you're at the trailhead for Abrams Falls so we had gone a few days before that and seen Anna Ruby Falls in North Georgia and we went to on the hike to Abrams Falls and on the sign it says 2.5 miles um, and it was moderate not easy but moderate we can do this so anyhow, it was a tough moderate, that's what I'm saying. <laughs> and it was up and down and over roots and rocks and all that stuff. And uh, when you get to Abrams Falls, there wasn't a great payoff when you got to the falls. It wasn't one of the greatest falls I've ever seen. And then you have to do the whole hike coming back. So we're coming back. It took us an hour and 15 minutes to do the two and a half miles one way. So we're doing that coming back. And my poor wife is dragging big time and... I turned around to her, and she said, we almost made it to 50 years. <laughs> I don't know whether that meant she was going to dump me, or whether she was going to die on the trail, or whatever, but here we are, you guys. Here we are. And uh, it's, uh, it's my great joy to be able to come and to, to bring the Word of God to you this morning, and to, to see JJ and, and Beth once again. Um, years fly by. And uh, as has been evidenced uh, between the services, I'm reminded once again of the fact that, you know, it's a small world for believers. It is. I mean, I met from somebody from New Jersey between the two services. I'm from New Jersey. Uh, met our insurance man's daughter, of all things, who's here today. So who knows how many other connections that we have. All right, here we go. Take a look at this picture, you guys. Any of you recognize this picture? Back in the day, as they say, uh, when I was a lot younger, I was on the brink of becoming a teenager. 
there was a TV show that we watched on our small screen and large console TV in black and white. This was the show. What was the name of it? Leave it to Beaver. You guys remember that. Yeah. Those were good old days. My hero, one of my first heroes in life, was one of the people in that family setting. It wasn't Ward Cleaver, the father, nor was it Theodore, the youngest one, who was called the beaver, but it was his older brother, his older brother named Wally. He's in the back. You might say, why did you like Wally? Well, because he was the older brother, for one thing, and in my family, there were just two brothers, myself and my younger brother, Don. So I liked him because he was the older brother. And besides, he was cool looking. He had wavy hair. He dressed cool. He just had an air about him. Not loud, but he was in control, you know. I looked up to him. Fortunately, as I've moved through life, I've found other heroes. <laughs> Better heroes, you know. One of my earliest recollections. This morning, I'm going to be turning our attention in Scripture to the book of Philippians, and I want to say just a couple introductory words about Philippians, and then we'll read a passage in Philippians and pray together and delve into that passage. But let me just say, by way of background here, that in the book of Philippians, which is not that long of an epistle, only four short chapters, uh, Paul is on the home stretch in Philippians when we come to the passage that we're going to be looking at this morning, actually chapter 317 through 41. When Paul wrote the letter to the Philippians, he was a prisoner. He was a prisoner in Rome under house arrest, an imprisonment that would last apparently two years. And during that two years, among other things, he wrote this letter to the Philippians, to Christians living in the Macedonian city of Philippi. The saints in that church were very dear saints to him. And part of the epistle that Paul writes, this epistle to the Philippians, is actually, believe it or not, a thank you note. When you come to chapter 4, verse 10 through 18, it reads like a thank you note. And why is he writing a thank you note to the Philippians? Because during his imprisonment, they had sent a gift to him. They had sent a gift to him to help support him in his time of imprisonment. You might say, what in the world does a prisoner need? A prisoner doesn't need anything, does he? Well, you know, imprisonments were not paid for by the state back in that time. And if you wanted to eat or if you wanted to change clothes, you had to be supported. The church in Philippi sent a gift to him. Uh, this is an epistle I'd like to point out also that is really permeated with joy. Next time you read Philippians, take note of every time the word joy or rejoice or gladness comes up. Uh, in this particular Bible of mine, and I think many of my Bibles, every time joy and rejoice and gladness comes up, I've colored it through with red, and it's like a salt shaker into the book of Philippians. In addition to that, it's an epistle that is saturated with Christ. Here's the way the, the epistle begins. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi. It's the way the epistle begins in verse 1. At the other end, the last verse of the last chapter reads, The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. And the Lord Jesus is mentioned many other times in this epistle. Matter of fact, this is referred to as a Christological epistle. Christ is so much in evidence in this epistle. The section for our attention this morning is, as I indicated, in chapter 3, beginning with verse 17, and I want to read this passage, and then we'll pray for the Lord's help as we look at, into it further. 317. Brothers, Join in imitating me, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. For many of whom I have often told you, and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly, and they glory in their shame 
with minds set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And from it, we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. Let's please pray together. Heavenly Father, we have just read from the living word of the living and true God. This is not just a good book. This is a book that has no other book like it. You have given it to us, Lord, that we might know about you, that we might know about this world that we live in, that we might know about ourselves. Lord, you've given this book to us that we might be pointed to Christ. And Heavenly Father, as we have the privilege this morning of looking into part of the Word of God, Please help us this morning. Open our eyes, Lord. Open our minds. But most of all, open our hearts that we might embrace the truth of your word, that we might hear it gladly. And we pray that the proclamation of your word would be accompanied by the working of your Holy Spirit so that fruit would be brought forth. And Lord, I want to thank you right now this morning that the Word of God tells us that whenever the Word of God is proclaimed, it does not return void or empty, but it accomplishes exactly the purpose for which you've sent it out. So, Lord, do that this morning. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, This passage that we read this morning just a minute ago begins with the word brothers brothers it's not the first time that Paul has used that word in this epistle and it won't be the last time either but it's a term that conveys Paul's affection for those that he is writing to those who belonged to the same spiritual family that he belonged to and although I am a real newcomer here at Ridge Point Church, I feel that I am among family and friends. I do. Brothers and sisters in Christ. In this passage, there are going to be four things that we will look at this morning. Paul is going to share examples to be imitated, first of all. He is going to share the exposing of certain enemies. He's then going to talk about expecting a better day. And finally, an exhortation, a closing exhortation to dear friends. So let's begin by looking at this passage, at the first of these things, and that is found in verse 17, if I may read it again. Brothers, join in imitating me and keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. Did you see what Paul just said there? He said, join in imitating me. You might say, wasn't that a little bit egotistical of Paul to say such a thing as that? Uh, May I say to you very quickly, I don't think so. I don't think that was egotistical of Paul. And I don't say that just because I'm a great lover of Paul. I mean, I taught many, many years Uh, classes on the epistles of Paul and the book of Acts and all that. And I love Paul, I do. But I don't say no just because I happen to be a great lover of Paul. Paul wasn't perfect. I know that. And I trust you know that. Nobody in this congregation this morning is perfect. Matter of fact, no one that has ever lived in this world with one single exception was perfect. And that was the Lord Jesus. But although Paul wasn't perfect... When he says, join in imitating me, he is writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. This is God's message to the church in Philippi. 
It really is. In chapter 4, verse 9 of Philippians, Paul said this, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. See, Paul had been with the church in Philippi when the gospel first came to that city. We read about it in Acts chapter 16. It was during Paul's second missionary journey that he came to Philippi. And for some period of time, uh, Dr. Luke, the author, doesn't specify how long Paul was there, but it's a pretty long chapter of attention given to the initial ministry in Philippi. May I say to you, those people who no doubt heard the gospel for the very first time, they not only heard Paul, but they saw Paul and they watched him day after day after day. They saw an individual who was a true servant of Christ, an individual who was very concerned for their welfare, not only their present welfare, but their eternal welfare. And thus he brought the gospel to them. They heard him. They saw him. Now Paul says, practice the things that you've seen and heard in me. There's another very important verse, I think perhaps the most important verse of all when we consider the Apostle Paul as an example. It's a pretty simple verse. It would be very easy to memorize. It's 1 Corinthians 11, 1, where Paul says, Be imitator, imitators of me, even as I am of Christ. Do you understand what Paul is saying there? He is saying, follow me, inasmuch as I follow Christ. In essence, Paul was saying, if ever I have veered away from doing things the way Christ would do them or saying things like Christ would have said, don't follow my example. But as I have represented Christ, as I have walked with Christ, as I have spoken the things that Christ spoke, follow me. Uh, in 1 Thessalonians 1, 6, Paul said, you became imitators of us and of the Lord. When the Thessalonian saints followed Paul's example, Paul said, listen, you were following the Lord in following us. Man, the first time I ever read that verse and it really registered to me what Paul was saying, it blew me away. And, and it really challenged me in my life to ask myself the question, when people see me, when people see how I live my life, when people hear how I talk, when people see the kind of attitudes I display, the kind of reactions I have to other people, do they see Christ? That's got to be our goal. That's what Paul was for these Philippian saints. In verse 17, once again, at the end of that verse, Paul says, Keep your eyes on those who walk according to the example you have in us. The example you have in us. Uh, may I just share with you a very simple Greek word today, which is the word behind our English translation, example. It's the Greek word, tupas. We got our English word, type, from it. But the Greek word carries the idea of that which is formed by a blow, that is striking a blow. I'm reminded again of an old TV show from way back in the black and white TV shows, Dragnet. Do you remember that show? My name is Friday. I'm a cop, right? <laughs> just the facts, ma'am. Just the facts. At the very end of those half-hour shows, a sweaty arm and hand would come on the screen holding a die and then the other hand would come on with a big hammer and whack that die. And when the die was removed, there was the Roman numeral seven on the wall because those shows were produced by Mark Seven Productions. That thing that was held was a die. And when the hammer struck the blow, the image of that die was placed on whatever the die was placed on. 
When Paul talks about being an example, what he is saying in essence is this. The image of Christ has been struck on me. The image of Christ. I'll tell you what. The more I read the scriptures of the New Testament that pertain to Paul, his epistles, a large chunk of the book of Acts, the more I am impressed, even after all these years, of how closely Paul followed Christ and how much the image of Christ was struck on him. See, that's why Paul is saying, brothers, join in imitating me. Beloved people, dear people, this needs to be our desire, doesn't it? That Christ would be seen in us. That when other people see us, they would have glimpses of Christ because of our words, our actions, our attitudes, our reactions, those type things. Matter of fact, when Paul says, and keep your eyes on those who walk according to, Paul actually shares another couple examples in this very epistle of individuals who were worthy to be followed as examples. In chapter 2, beginning with verse 19, Paul talks about Timothy. Timothy is a pretty familiar name in the New Testament. Timothy was an individual that Paul could talk of as his own son. Not his physical son, but his spiritual son. No doubt the one that Paul had won to the Lord. Timothy, dearly, dearly loved by Paul. His own genuine son in the faith, he called him. How is Timothy an example that Paul had shared with the Philippians? Well, in verse 20 of chapter 2, Paul says, For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. And no doubt what Paul means is for their spiritual welfare. When Paul sent Timothy to them, Paul couldn't go himself because he was a prisoner in Rome. When he sent Timothy to them, he could say, I send him with all confidence that Timothy will be concerned for your spiritual welfare and he will minister to you just like I would have ministered to you. So follow his example, you Philippian saints. The second individual that Paul talks about in chapter 2 is a name a little less familiar in the New Testament. It's the name Epaphroditus. Epaphroditus was the representative of the Philippian church when they sent the gift to Paul to help support his needs. Epaphroditus. You know, when Epaphroditus made that trip from Philippi in Macedonia, the area that we now call Greece, when he traveled to Rome, whether it was during that trip or after his arrival in Rome to deliver that gift to Paul, Epaphroditus became sick. Do you know how sick he became? Well, if you read chapter 2, verses 25 through the end, you find that his sickness was so serious that Paul, as it were, describes him as being on death's doorstep. Serious illness. But God was gracious. And God restored the health of Epaphroditus so that Epaphroditus could be sent back home to the Philippian saints that were worried about him. But here's what Paul says about him at the end of chapter 2. He says in verse 29, So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. He risked his life in performing a very needful ministry that related to Paul. He poured his life into that. Paul said, follow men like this. Examples to follow. May I say, find good and godly examples. Keep your eye on them. Watch them closely. Imitate them. And pray for them. You know, one of the things I'm going to take away from being with you all this morning and worshiping is that thing about the, the, uh, the men's group, the fight club. 
and their dedication to fight for their family and for their children and all that. My goodness, how great is that ministry? And just as has been said, th those men, because of their seriousness in wanting to honor the Lord in that, those men are going to have targets on their back. Satan's not going to be happy with that. Do you think the Apostle Paul walked around with a big target on his back? I think so. Yeah, for sure. But Paul followed Christ. There's no shortage of examples in this world. You know, Hollywood provides examples. The music world provides examples. Sports provides examples. I said in the first service, and I'll repeat again, how many youth soccer players want to be like Messi or Ronaldo or Chicharito or Michael Bradley or Alex Morgan, who's a girl, by the way, a woman, a woman soccer player, by the way. You know, it's natural, especially for our younger people, to follow examples. But as we pursue this passage a little bit further here, Paul transitions from verse 17 into verse 18 to talk about certain individuals who were on the opposite end of the spectrum from the ones that Paul was just talking about, ones who followed Christ and were good examples for the church to follow. He now talks about individuals who are enemies, and he exposes them. Listen once again as I read to you verses 18 and 19. Paul says, for many of whom I have often told you and now tell you even with tears, walk as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their belly and they glory in their shame with minds set on earthly things. Exposing enemies of the cross of Christ. May, may I just say a couple general things about them before we look a little bit at the specifics that Paul shares about them. First of all, Paul says that they were many. There weren't just a couple of them. There were many. How often in Scripture do we read about the manys in contrast to the few? Jesus says there are few who are on the path that leads to life how many are on the path that leads to destruction? Many. Multitudes. Here Paul warns the church about many individuals whom he described as enemies. It's not the first time in this very epistle that Paul has warned the church about enemies to their spiritual life and well-being. He has earlier talked in chapter 3 about individuals that he actually called dogs and evildoers and uh, a mutilation party in the church. Uh, we called them the Judaizers. Another thing that I think is very significant as Paul begins to talk about them is, is that he says that even as he was writing this, even as he was telling these people about them, he was moved to tears. Paul was not some cold, dispassionate, professional apostle who just went through the motions and did the stuff. No. Paul was deeply moved by the danger that threatened those that he deeply loved. It moved him to tears. You ever get moved to tears? Sure we do. We all get moved to tears. I think the older I get, the more I get moved to tears easily. But what is it that causes us to have tears? Genuine tears. Not just a sad TV show or movie. Always moved to tears at the thought of these who were enemies of their spiritual welfare. Now, how does Paul describe them? He uses certain phrases here to describe them. And, and before I look at these specifics, may I just say to you that there are many Bible commentators, good, sound, conservative Bible commentators, who say that even though the passage does not explicitly state this, still it seems very probable that these individuals that Paul is about to describe were professing Christians. 
So how does he describe them? First of all, he says they are enemies of the cross of Christ. Now, when it comes to Paul, Paul himself said in Galatians 6, 14, but God forbid that I should glory or boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that. Think about that. The cross. We're all familiar with the cross, what the cross is. But are we? The cross was an instrument of capital punishment in the world of that time. Not just capital punishment, but capital punishment that was designed to inflict the maximum pain to the individual who was suffering crucifixion. And the pain was incredible. The pain lasted for days oftentimes. Excruciating pain. Even that word excruciating has as its derivation the little word cross right in the middle of it. Excruciating. But not only was death by crucifixion painful, but it was shameful shameful. Paul said a glory in the cross. Why could Paul glory in an instrument of capital punishment? He gloried in the cross because there on the cross the sin debt was paid in full. The sin debt was paid in full. Christ drank to the dregs the cup of God's righteous wrath against sin, against your sin and mine, against Paul's sin. And the cross wasn't the final word, was it? It would be a sad story indeed in the New Testament if the cross was the final word. And when Jesus spoke the words, it is finished, as he breathed his last on the cross, the story comes to an end there. No, no doesn't come to an end there. Three days later, as Jesus had promised, the tomb was open and our Lord Jesus was alive. And by that, God certified the fact that that payment for sin was accepted. It is finished. Whereas Paul gloried in the cross, the enemies that he is warning the church in Philippi about are individuals who despised the cross, apparently. It was something abhorrent to them. They were enemies of the cross. Their message was not flee to the cross and there find life. No, theirs was a message they didn't want to have anything to do with the cross and its shame and its suffering. A second thing that Paul says about them is that their God is their belly. Now, that's an interesting phrase, isn't it? Their God is their belly. I think what that means is that for these false teachers that Paul is warning the church in Philippi about, the God that they worshipped was actually their fleshly appetites and desires. Their fleshly appetites and desires. That was what they really worshipped. What would you associate with that? Well, certainly sexual immorality would be associated with that. Certainly, gluttony would be associated with that. Wasn't it Christ himself who said, if anyone would come after me, let him do what? Deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. But these individuals that Paul is warning the church about, warning them with tears, were individuals who were enemies of the cross of Christ Their God was their belly, and a third description of them is that their glory is their shame. That which should have caused them to be ashamed was something that they actually gloried in and reveled in. Isn't that the absolute opposite of the way things ought to be? Yeah. So so much of this is not only so relevant in what Paul is writing to the Philippians here, but it is so relevant for the world in which we live. Are there enemies of the cross of Christ in this world? Not a few. Are there individuals who 
whose God is their belly, that is their sensual appetites, that's all they serve, that's all they want, they can never get enough of it? Sure. Are there individuals in this world who glory in the things that really ought to make them be ashamed? Yeah. One of the things that I think has characterized our day and age is that we've forgotten how to blush. You know, there are things that when I was a youngster, I, I would blush at. Things that are carried on TV as commercials for Pete's sake that wouldn't be shown in polite company back in the day. But now it's just common fare. Paul says they glory in their shame, and he says furthermore their mind is set on earthly things, things that are bound to this earth, bound to this world, bound to the system that is run contrary to the kingdom of God and to Christ. Yeah. When Paul wrote to the Colossians, another epistle that he wrote during that two-year imprisonment, he said to them in chapter 3, set your mind on things above where Christ is. You know, that can be one of the greatest remedies to the filth that we constantly encounter in this world is to make it a regular practice to try to set our mind on heavenly things. May, may, may I give you a very simple, I mean really, really, really simple way of doing that? Feed yourself in the Word regularly. Feed yourself in the Word. The Word is going to turn your mind to heavenly things. It is. Don't live a day without feasting in the Word. And may I even go so far as to say, be voracious in your appetite for the Word? Yeah. Now, there's one more thing that Paul says about them, and very interestingly, Paul gave this at the very top of these descriptive phrases about them. Enemies of the cross of Christ, whose God is their belly, who they glory in their shame, their mind is set on earthly things. The very first thing Paul said about them is this. Their end is destruction. That's what's going to happen to individuals who are enemies of the cross and all those other things that we've just looked at. Their end is destruction. For individuals who don't want anything to do with the cross, who flee from the cross rather than fleeing to the cross to confess their sins and repent of their sins and call upon Christ to save them, destruction awaits them. Now, let me make it very clear here this morning that when Paul uses the word destruction here, he's not talking about annihilation. You know, they're going to be wiped out. They will disappear like they were never here. No, no. No, no. The Bible doesn't teach that. When Paul says, whose end is destruction, he's talking about the fact that they're going to be cast into a state of utter ruin and eternal destruction, eternal torment, where they will suffer the wrath of God on sinners. Their end is destruction. They're pretty sobering words, aren't they? Pretty sobering words. And Paul said, when I write these words to you, Philippians, I'm writing these words with tears. Perhaps there were even teardrops on the sheet of papyrus as Paul wrote this epistle. But I want to turn to a third thing now, and it's the very next thing that Paul comes to in this short passage of Scripture. In verse 20, Paul says, But our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like His glorious body by the power that enables Him even to subject all things to Himself. Now, may we progress forward one slide here, and on the left of the picture... There is a frieze of a Roman family or a gathering of Romans. Now, why would I even show a picture like that? For this reason, when Paul starts in this next thing, and that is expecting a better day, he says, but our citizenship is in heaven. 
let, let me talk to you very briefly here about what Paul had in mind when he said our citizenship, addressing the Philippians, that their citizenship was in heaven. The city of Philippi had a distinctive feature in that it is identified as a colony of Rome. Not every city had that distinctive feature. Matter of fact, not many cities were privileged to be a colony of Rome, but Philippi was one. What did it mean to be a colony of Rome? It meant that essentially when the city of Philippi was founded as a colony of Rome, it became a miniature Rome away from Rome. When the city of Philippi was founded in that way, it was initially inhabited by Roman military veterans who with their families founded the city. The people had great privileges there, privileges that most people in the Roman world did not have. They were Roman citizens. They prided themselves in their Roman way of life. You see, when that word citizenship is used there, there is such a richness connected that, with that word that we don't see if we just read over it quickly. But Paul says to them, for our citizenship, our polituma, is in heaven. The Christians in Philippi had a dual citizenship. You know that? They were citizens of Rome. What a great privilege that was. But they were citizens of heaven. What a greater privilege that was. Now Paul says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and from it we await a Savior. What will it be like when Jesus returns? Will there be a bright light in heaven that we'll see? Something like pictured on the left hand. I really do not know. There are a number of descriptions in Scripture that talk about a blast of a trumpet and, and all kinds of other things. But what Paul is writing here is one particular feature that will be associated with the return of Christ that we can all rejoice in. He says that we are eagerly expecting Christ's return because an incredible transformation is going to take place. Our, what Paul calls here, our lowly body will be made like his glorious body. Our lowly body. I'm looking out on a congregation of lowly bodies. <laughs> More literally, it is a, a body of humiliation. Now, the longer we live in this world, the longer your list gets of difficulties physically that you face in this world. Trust me. I'm, I'm 73 and my list is a lot longer than it was back in my 20s. A lot longer. I'm not going to read my list to you. You wouldn't be concerned with my list. Listen, every step that we take in this world is a step closer to the grave. I know that's not a pleasant statement to make, but is that true? undeniably so every step we take is a step closer to the grave and although we are fearfully and wonderfully made as the psalmist wrote in Psalm 139 yet the fact of the matter is that with every day and successive year of our life we realize that good health is a fragile thing isn't it I mean in just a snap of a finger things can become very much different from what they are. And if that's not enough, every day, every one of us who has named the name of Christ in truth, every day, we struggle with sin in this mortal body. We do. We do. The flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. The two are contrary one to another. You read the end of Romans chapter 7, chapter 7, verse 14 on to the end. And I'll tell you what, when I read it, it's like I'm looking right in the mirror. The things that I want to do are so often the things that I don't do. And the things, well, read it for yourself. Paul says, that when Christ returns, as he promised he will, and as the scriptures so clearly declare, when he returns, there's going to be a change. A big change. When this lowly body 
this body of our humiliation will be made like unto his glorious body. No more allergies. No more pains. No more cancer. None of that. Wow. And how will that take place? Paul just adds the phrase here, by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. <laughs> In other words, there's no shortage of power with God. There's no shortage of power with Christ to accomplish the very thing that he's just described here, changing our mortal bodies to a body that is like to his glorious body. Dearly beloved people, is that something to long for or not? It is, to be sure. But as we long for it, we long for it realizing that all the days that God has given us in this world, we must live for Christ and have the image and imprint of Christ on us. There's one more thing here. Chapter 4, verse 1, Paul writes, Therefore, my brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm thus in the Lord, my beloved. This is a closing exhortation to dear friends. Next slide here. On the left of this next slide, in what are really bright red letters, if you can see it, is this whole list of terms that Paul uses in this one single verse to describe the, Corinth, the Philippian saints. My brothers, whom I love and long for, my joy and my crown, my beloved. I know of no verse exactly like that in all of Paul's epistles where so many terms of affection are all brought together into this verse, which is just packed to the brim. Did Paul love these people? Did Paul have an exceptionally close relationship to these people? I think Paul had a closer relationship to the saints in Philippi than he did for any of the other churches, and he loved the other churches, believe me. But in the midst of all those terms of his deep affection for them, he emphasizes one final, simple statement, which kind of capsulizes all that we've looked at today. And it is this. Stand firm thus in the Lord. Stand firm. Stand firm. We are living in a world that is wavering and changing in ways that are alarming, not for the better. Paul told the Philippians, stand firm. In the Word of God, God tells us the same thing. Stand firm. Stand firm, dearly beloved people. Don't be shaken. Don't be moved about. Stand firm on the truth. In Philippians chapter 1, verse 27, Paul said, Only let your manner of life be worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent, I may hear that you are standing firm in one spirit, with one mind, striving side by side for the faith of the gospel. Uh, the, the words of the original language there convey a picture of an athletic team that is functioning together with one common goal. You know, we're not alone in this Christian life, are we? Sometimes we can feel very much alone, but we are not alone. We're not. We have one another, and one another, we ought to move forward to show Christ to the world. Yeah, like an athletic team, competes together to win the game. What has Paul said here? Stand firm as the godly examples that you have seen have done, like Paul himself and Timothy and Epaphroditus. Stand firm as you avoid being influenced by the enemies of the cross that he has warned them about. Stand firm 
as you await the return of our Savior with eager expectation for the change that it's going to make for us. Dearly beloved people, as I close today, I, I, I feel absolutely compelled to say one final word about the cross of Christ. The cross of Christ. Now, as you sit here this morning, you are either one who has fled to the cross and confessed your sins and laid hold on Christ by faith, or else you sit here as an enemy of the cross of Christ. You might say, no, I'm, I'm neutral to that. No, there's no neutral ground. No neutral ground. You either know Christ and have a saving relationship with Him or else you are apart from Christ and being apart from Christ, according to the Scriptures, you are lost and without hope in this world. Now, you, you know what my, my great desire is? And that is that every single person in here today does indeed and in truth, know Christ as their personal Savior and the Lord of their life. I pray that that's the case. But I know that in most churches, most good Bible-believing churches even, there are people who don't know Christ, who come to Christ maybe for a number of reasons. May I appeal to you today as we close, if you don't know Christ, do not leave this day without putting your trust fully in Christ. Because if you do, if you leave today without knowing Christ, you're taking a great risk. You're gambling your life away. You don't know when your life will end. And dear people, and I trust this is most, if not all of you, if you do know Christ, thank God for godly examples that are set forth in Scripture and that you see lived out before you. And you too desire and pray and strive to be a godly example so that people will see Christ in you and they'll hear the saving message of the cross from you as well.